do a uh, sound check, so I probably need to turn this up. Doug. Can you hear me? What about back there? Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. What about now? <laughs> it's good to see you all this morning. I'm thankful to be able to be with you again this morning and <clears throat> and uh, thankful to the Lord for his blessings. <clears throat> been traveling, of course, and preaching, and the Lord has been gracious to us in our efforts to serve him and uh, in the other churches that I've been visiting with. And uh, But I want you to know it's, it's, it's such a joy to be able to be back home and to be with you and see your faces this morning and to be blessed to worship the Lord with you. So I ask that you pray for me this morning and <clears throat> remember uh, yeah, Tara, uh, her little boy named Wade, I got a text this morning that he has uh, had a little trouble with uh, fever and difficulty breathing and he's in the hospital <clears throat> and I know she'll appreciate your prayers along with all the others that are uh, on the prayer list that that uh, you probably have already seen. Sister Lois does a good job getting that out early enough so everybody can view it and uh, making corrections that need to be made. What? He has viral pneumonia. Viral? He does not have COVID. Has viral pneumonia, not COVID. She wanted to be sure she said that. So anyway, pray for him and others that need. Continue to please pray for my voice. It's improved some. Uh, uh, I'm not saying it sounds better this morning, but I can tell, if I can tell the difference, it's, it's different. So please pray that the Lord will help us in the service this morning. I need your prayers probably more than ever this morning as I try to present what's before me. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one for me, and I need the grace of God. I uh, always need the grace of God to speak, but I especially ask that you pray for it this morning. Ask Brother Larry to come and uh, say whatever you want to say, brother, and then if you will, offer our prayer. Good morning. I did get a prayer request from Sister Lori this morning. She wasn't real specific, just pray for her nephew. That's all I got, so let's uh, keep them in, in, and maybe I'll get some more throughout the church service through text, but that was just before I came up here. So, if you would, bow with me, and I'll endeavor to pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, <coughs> we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for allowing us to meet for the purpose of worshiping thee, Lord. We ask that you would bless those that have been mentioned this morning, bless those that are on our prayer list, bless the sick, bless the needy, bless our men and women of the armed forces, Lord, our ones that serve us, both here and abroad, our men and women from our first responders, bless them, Lord. Bless them with their safety and return them safely home if it be your will. And Lord, we ask that we, as we change the order of service this morning, we ask that you would bless us. We ask that you would bless Elder Steve with the message, bless him with spiritual mind, Lord, that he may deliver that message to us and bless each and every one in this audience, Lord, with a spiritual ears, spiritual heart, that they may hear and receive that message, Lord. Bless us in, in the weeks to come, Lord. We ask that you would just be with us, Lord. We know yes. that the devil attacks us yes. so much every day, Lord, and we just ask that you protect us. Forgive us for our many sins and shortcomings. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Appreciate it so much. Love you. <clears throat> Turn with me to Psalm 19 this morning. <clears throat> I've spent quite a bit of time preaching in the New Testament um, in the past few years. And... Uh, have been uh, blessed, I, I felt, to be able to preach uh, a good number of 
sermons through John. <clears throat> Mainly in the last few years, I've been preaching out of the Gospels themselves. Uh, really, there's no place uh, to reside better than in the Gospels uh, of the life and works of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he's what this is all about. This ain't all about me. This ain't all about Brother Mike. This is about the Lord Jesus. And so we want to present him to you. <clears throat> but even if we go into the Old Testament, you're going to find that it's still all about him. It's not about Moses. It's not about Abraham. It's not about David, although those are good characters. They're individuals that are uh, weighty characters uh, in the Old Testament. And, and even all the way back to Adam. But none of them are weightier than the God who created everything. And God that brought all this into existence and the God of grace that has preserved us to this hour. I think we'll agree with that. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen, because <clears throat> when it says in the, the first verse of our text this morning in uh, Psalm 19, the heavens declare <clears throat> the glory of God. The word glory, the New Testament, the uh, Greek word for glory is doxa. <clears throat> the other, the Old Testament is kabal, and it is a word that means weightiness. Now, I remember some of you that are gray-headed and closer, closer to my age, remember back in the 70s, you'd say something that really had some uh, substance to it, and, and the hippies would say, man, that's heavy. You young folks probably don't know what we're talking about. That means, that means that's, that's weighty. But you know what? Uh, beyond all of that, God is weightier to the nth degree weightier. He is something that is beyond our comprehension. He's worthy of our worship. Amen? So, when we look at this psalm, Psalm 19, this particular psalm is about his word. Now, since God is so weighty, now we aren't going to listen to hippies and their, uh, their theology or their philosophy, but since God is so weighty, that means, that is, he's weighty beyond any of his creation. We certainly want to hear what, he got, what he's got to say. Amen? Now, there may be politicians that will say stuff, and it might be worth listening to, but it might not be. But everything that God says is worth listening to because he knows everything. Amen? Psalm 19 is about the word of God. And it's interesting. <clears throat> you go 100 Psalms later to Psalm 119, the entire 150 verses of that Psalm are about the word of God. In every verse, there's a reference to the word of God. Let me give you for instance, just if you'll turn with me and, and intended on doing this, but I think you'll bear with me for a moment. Psalm 119, every verse has reference to the Word of God in one form or not. Now, it doesn't have to be the Word of God in that form, W-O-R-D, but it might be in the form of commandment. It might be in the form of law, etc., testimony, but it's a form of the Word of God. Blessed Psalm 119, 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law. That's the word of the Lord. 
Blessed are they that keep the testimonies. That's the word of God. And that seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. That's the word of God. In every verse, in 150 verses, you find reference to the word of God. Sounds like David was concerned in, in writing these psalms and the people who are reading or listening to him that they be mindful of the word of God. Now, sometimes Bibles are coffee table fixtures. Sometimes they are places to put valuable documents like nobody will think to look in the Bible, right? Well, why would that be? If it's a frequently used item, that seems like that may be the first thing that you, first place you might look. So people use them for various reasons. They'll have a Bible on the coffee table. Now my daddy was notorious for speeding. I'm talking about his car. He'd get a new car every two years. Used to make mama mad as a hornet, you know, because he'd get a car every two years because he had to have a new car. And he liked to have a faster car and a better car. But when he went to church, he'd make sure he put his Bible right up on the dashboard. <clears throat> and he didn't know that we knew why he was doing that because he was stopped often for speeding in his new cars. And whether he would ever admit it at the point of a gun, he put that Bible up there so the cop would see the Bible and give him a break. Sometimes they're used for a variety of reasons. But the Bible is meant to be read. It is meant to be absorbed into our lives. You'll see that in this psalm. It is the most precious thing that we can own. More than your house, more than your car, more than the fancy clothes that you might wear. Let me tell you, the Bible is so valuable. In Psalm 19, 1, he said, the heavens declare. That word declare is a, is a uh, declaration of the word. It is a declared word. I, might, I guess I wanted to say. It's the declared word. But notice who's, who's claiming it. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. That is, the heavens are speaking. Now, does that grab you like it does me? <clears throat> when you're out on a starry night and you're looking at the beauty of the starry heavens in Texas, found out you could see more of the starry heavens when I moved to Texas. In Mississippi, you can only see a strip like this. Moved out to Texas and got a big sky. Man, it was something to behold, the vault of heaven in the skies of Texas. And they say it's even better if you go out farther west. But when you look at the starry heaven, there is, it's speaking to us. It is declaring to us the glory of God. It is. So when Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, he says this. <clears throat> in verse 20 of chapter 1, he says, For the invisible things of him, that is of God, the invisible things of him from the creation 
of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. The word is so profound. The word speaks so clearly, so loudly. I'm talking about the word of creation, the creation that surrounds us and that's above us speaks so loudly that even if you never heard a gospel sermon about it, it declares the glory of God and you are without excuse before him. That's what the word of God says. Marvelous, isn't it? That's, that sounds like a profound, that sounds like a uh, articulate speech that any of God's creation can see and recognize that he is there. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament his handiwork. <clears throat> Notice that word. I like what's the... I like what John Gill said about this. He said that literally means his hand work. <clears throat> now we got back breaking work, you know, digging ditches. We got mind work. <clears throat> and then we've got hand work that's articulate and specific. Somebody who works with their hands. I just got through. I just got through putting up a room of crown mold at the house. Hadn't done it in a while. Very frustrating when you hadn't done it in a while, but it requires a lot of detailed handwork to do it right. <clears throat> and David says that God's creation that speaks to us is full not only of his marvelous power in speaking the universe into existence, commanding it and it happening, but also the detailed work of his creation, his handiwork. It's glorious to see it, isn't it? I like how, I like how he starts this psalm off, aren't you? And that's God speaking to us, even the smallest detail of creation, all the way down to the microscopic, declares the glory of God. There are scientists now that have seen, <clears throat> without a bacteria, have seen a little machine, a flagella machine in the bacteria, and it actually rotates like a rotary engine and is performing a function that's necessary for us to replicate ourselves over and over and over again. And it just runs like a perpetual motion machine and operates and the little turbine just turns and turns and turns and it's so small, you can't see it, but it's there. Intricate, yet powerful. That just accidentally happened, right? Let me tell you something, folks. There are not enough billion years for that to happen accidentally. A smart, brilliant, knowledgeable, wise, creator made it do what it does when he created it. That's magnificent. The handiwork of God is beyond our comprehension, but it's not above us giving glory to God for it. Amen. He says, day by day, or excuse me, day unto day, uttereth speech. <clears throat> Notice that, Amelia. Notice the whole of this verse. Day unto day uttereth speech. Night unto night showeth 
knowledge, both those expressions, speech, knowledge, have reference to the word of God. Now, he's saying from sunrise to sunset to sunrise again, says something. The night coming and going and then coming back says something. You know what it says to me? That we're temporary. You know why? Because there's a lot of nights and a lot of days that have happened for a 67 year old. When I look in the mirror, I see the evidence of it. Now Maggie, you can't tell yet, but one of these days, I'm sorry, you'll be able to tell. Now you might put makeup on it, but you'll still be able to tell that God has created us, but the days are passing. I like what Elder Clevenger said in this song. My days are passing swiftly by. My journey soon shall end. He says even the days of our lives speak to us. I mean it screams to us our temporary existence. We only have a short time in this world. You know, I'm 67, and it's just been like that. Man, I can remember when I was nine years old, real clear. Now, I can't remember what happened yesterday, but I can remember what happened when I was nine years old, very clear. And it just seems like yesterday. And now here I am, an old man, horse, gray-headed, half bald, aches and pains everywhere trying to preach the gospel to the Lord's people. The days have declared something, that sin has entered into the world and death by sin, and I am in need of a redeemer. I'm in need of rescuing. And guess who the rescuer is? The same one that speaks to me daily and tells me that I'm temporary has also given me a redeemer. And he has redeemed me from the penalty of sin and he has rescued me. And I want you to understand something, though I may leave this body in a tomb someday, and I will, unless the Lord comes, I will. He, my friends, has saved us from the power of the grave by his miraculous and marvelous power. It speaks to us, doesn't it? I mean, it's pretty amazing when you look at it, right? Here's the amazing thing about it. <clears throat> Notice the next verse. Now we're talking about the, how creation, a three-leaf book, you know, heaven, earth, and the sea. Heaven, earth, and the sea. It's a three-leaf book. I like that Spurgeon said that. I didn't say that. I'm just repeating him. But I thought it's pretty good to repeat. But the first page of the book, heaven, makes looking at the other two pages make sense. It declares his glory. Notice he said this. There, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. When heaven declares his glory, heaven is shouting, I am God and I'm here. It's understandable in every language. Cantonese, Korean, Spanish, whatever language. We can look and view his creation and it speaks to us that I'm here. Believe you me, folks, 
He is here, isn't he? There's no speech nor language. Breaks down language barriers. Makes it interesting when we think about Pentecost, right? His word would be proclaimed that day in a way that it hadn't been at that point. The Holy Spirit came, anointed, and fell upon the apostles with cloven tongues as a fire. And those Galileans spoke with tongues. Glossa is the word. You know what a glossa is? It's languages. They spoke with other tongues. We got Galileans speaking so the Syrians could understand them, so the Scythians could understand them, so the different ones that had drifted off into Gentile nations that were present on the day of Pentecost, they could understand them. It says in their own tongue in which they said even said it. How is it we understand these men? In the, in the tongue wherein we were born. So that's how we know they were talking languages, not gibberish. They were speaking languages understandable to the different dialects that were there that day. God, by his miraculous power, on that day, broke down the language barrier. The language barrier was put there by God in Genesis 11. At the Tower of Babel, he confounded their tongues. They had to leave off the building of the tower and separated the languages that day. And on the day of Pentecost, for the gospel's sake and for his glory's sake, he broke down the language barriers. And his gospel had free course that day. Miraculous, isn't it? David is saying, God's language that I'm here and that I'm glorious and that I am your God is speaking day by day. Now, if you're in a drunken hangover, and, you, and uh, I'm not saying anybody here would ever do that, I hope not, but if you are, the next day when the sun comes up, you say, oh no, oh God, help me, you know, the sun go away. But listen, somebody in their right mind, when they see the sun come up, if their mind's on right, thank God for another day. Amen, brother? Amen. We got another day. God gave me. You know what? We're only promised today. You do know that, right? Dave James says our lives are as vapor of smoke. It's here. It's gone. We're just here for a moment. And if God gives us another day, how wonderful it is. And we, we need to arise and thank our creator that he's given us another day. Amen? Amen? And then just like, you know, he gave us the Sabbath that was an honor and a respect and a glory to God for his creation. Because remember, he created the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. That was God's day. He rested. He see, he didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because he was finished with his work. And he rested on the seventh. And we recognize that day, that seventh day, as the day of rest, because God created all that is here on that day. He rested. Now, 
when you go to sleep at night. Sometimes you're restless, aren't you? Come on. I, I didn't know what you were talking about. When I was a kid, all you had to do is lean me up against something, I could sleep. When I was a carpenter, as a young man, I could lay on a sawhorse that wide and fall into a deep sleep. I even fell off of it a few times. Yeah, you know, so I could fall asleep anywhere. Now, like Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, I rise at the sound of a bird. I mean, if Gail wiggles a little bit over there, I'll wake up and keep sleeping the rest of the night. It's terrible. But I'm thankful after a hard day's work, or maybe after a hard day's study, that you're granted a night where you can rest. You can contemplate the day and thank God for the day and then rest as God has granted you for that. It's glory. And that declares the glory of God. God gave us a time with the rotation of the, of the earth around the, or the earth, rotation of the earth. He gave us an opportunity. You want to know one reason why it rotates like it does? So we can sleep. So we can rest. God gave his people rest. Now he gave us more rest than that. He also gave us the rest, according to Hebrews, the rest that is in the church. We know that. This is a place of rest. This is a place we can cease from our labors. This is a place where we can come and give glory to the one who's blessed us so richly. It is. So here, he says, uh, he says, day and uh, day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge that God is there. I hope that made sense. It did to me. So I hope it did to you. Verse 3. And now there's no speech or language where, where their voice is not heard. Maybe we dealt with that. Verse 4. Their line. Their line. That's an interesting word. If you look at that, look at that, that word in the original, it literally means something that's stretched out, a line that is stretched out. Their line, and it would make sense, since all over the earth, his voice is heard. The line of verse, the line of his speech, like this is on lines, it says, is gone out throughout all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. The place where he set it, he set a tabernacle, an enclosure. Now there's something about this, this thing called creation, some things that we don't understand and won't understand until we get to heaven. But creation has given us a place that is an enclosure in this solar system where we live that's a tabernacle or an enclosure for the sun. That's pretty glorious, isn't it? He says, he says their, their line has gone out throughout all the earth and the words to the end of the world. In them have they said a tabernacle for the sun. I think it means more than just the S-U-N. I think it means more than just the orb that sits up in the sky that we see in the, during the day. I think it has more, another reference, but it is a tabernacle. This whole place is a worshipful place to the sun, the son of the living God. But anyway, verse five, he said the sun, which is what he's referring to, which is a bride room coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. What he's saying is that's declaring 
the glory of God. The sunrise is declaring the glory of God. Like now in the old days, the bridegroom would come out of his chamber uh, when he was engaged to the young lady. He would come out of his chamber and there would be a big time of rejoicing, a big party made. Uh, and then they would lead the way and he'd go get his bride. Remember that, remember that story? So they would rejoice when the bridegroom came out and he was made ready for his bride. He says here, he says, when the sun comes up, it's like that. He says, which is a, like, is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. When you see the sun coming up, it's like the bridegroom. Guess who the bridegroom of the church is? Paul says in Ephesians, that it's Christ is the bridegroom. And we are the bride. As we see the Son of God come to us in our worship of Him, He's worthy of worship. When you feel Him, when you see Him in His Word, we rejoice like a bridegroom coming out of His chamber. He says, when you see the sun rise, it's just like that. He says, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, time of rejoicing, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. <clears throat> you know, the champion prances out on the track, you know, to run the race. And everybody cheers for the champion, you know. That's what he's talking about. But I'll tell you what, the race that's before us is many sunsets isn't it? And so God needs and deserves more and more praise and praise and pray. Every time we see the sun rise, we ought to be quick to thank God for that strong man who's run the race for us. Christ did something we couldn't do. He was sinless, kept the law to a jot and to a tittle. And we fail many times, don't we? I mean, we falter in our race. I lose most of the time. What about you? I want to do good. I'm like Paul in Romans chapter uh, 7. When I would do good, evil's present with me. That which I would not do, I do. That I would do, I do not. He says, I find a law within myself. When I would do good, evil is present with me. You want to read, read a uh, uh, description of a hopeless schizophrenic? Go read Romans 7. That's us. Because we are sinners living in sinful bodies. We're saved by the grace of God and we're bound for heaven, but we still have sinful bodies and we struggle with sin. Even though we're saved by the grace of God, we still struggle with it. But this one that won the race, who's pictured in the rising of the sun, he spent, you know when you're running a marathon? Now, in the 1980 marathon, you know, the first women's marathon, one of my favorite. I love to watch that marathon to this day. This little old short girl from the United States. She went out ahead of the pack. Now all those people were in the stadium. I mean, they had a packed stadium. It was the first women's marathon, Olympic marathon. She went out. They didn't know it, but she gone off and left the pack. By a long ways. They tried to catch her. They couldn't even get close. Little short girl. So they didn't know what was happening. All they got kind of updates, you know. We kind of get updates, don't we? But when she ran through, down through the tunnel and in the L.A. Coliseum and came out and they viewed her, Cheers went up. 
and they're mostly Americans there, you know, cheers went up. <laughs> Nobody had a chance of beating her. Let me tell you, friends, that's similar, very smallly, but similar to rejoicing when we see our strong man who has run the race and now he appears in the east in the sunrise. It is a reminder of redemption. <laughs> Glorious, isn't it? Notice verse 6. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. Now listen to this close. Notice what he's saying here. And scientists, by the way, has already proved what David is saying in this psalm. Notice it, please. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. What's he saying? Well, it's a funny thing. It is every time science, true science, never disproves the Bible. False science tries to, but they can't. But science has discovered that we know we're not sitting still. Now, I know we're not sitting still, but our solar system is not sitting still. It's rotating around the Milky Way. It takes millions of years to get around the Milky Way, Milky Way. According to them, it's moving. The sun's moving in a circuit. That's what he says right here. David wrote this by inspiration, and he says there is no end. Notice, his going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit is unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat or the effects of the sun. There's nobody, there's no thing that can hide from the effects of the Son of God. That's marvelous, isn't it? Ain't no need you trying to hide. There's no need you trying to say a rock's fall on us and hide us from his, uh, his judgment. It won't do any good. You can't hide from God. Now, I thought I could when I was little. I thought if I hid, I could do little mean things and God wouldn't see me. Guess what? I found out. He found me anyway. And guess what? We might not say that actually as adults, but sometimes we act like it as adults. We act like God can't see it. Or we just kind of turn God off in our mind and pretend God can't see us. Oh, he'll save me by his grace, right? Let me tell you something, friend. You can't hide from God. He will... Come over to the rock you're hiding under and take the, remember the preacher that said that, and take the rock and lift it up and say, there you are, come on out. He'll find you wherever you are. Nothing is hid from his heat or the effects of the Son of God. Now real quickly, to wrap this up, notice verse 7, appropriately, positioned in verse 7. There are six references to the word of God in the name the coming verses. The word of God is referred to in various ways like I mentioned before. And there are six benefits that he noticed that we notice from the word of God. And we are referred to in six different ways as being recipients of the effects of it. Now, I can't go and read these in real detail, if you'll forgive me this morning because of time, but I'd like you to notice the structure of the next couple of verses. 
the law of the Lord is perfect. Who wants to say amen? amen. It's perfect. This mighty, this mighty government that we have is based on his law. And every, every condemnation that's ever been has been based on God's law. It's perfect. It doesn't need any revision. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Thou shalt work, have no other gods before me. It, there's no way to make that better than what it is. Thou shalt not steal. Can't make anything. I mean, every one of the laws of God are perfect. And if we live by them, it's glorifying to our creator. It don't get any better than that. The only thing that would be better is, is if we'd obey them better, right? But notice, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now listen to that. The law of the Lord is beneficial and converting. Converting means a turn. It's kind of like repent. It means a turning about or a changing of mind. But notice where the, the word of the law of God, when it, when it enters into the picture, notice what it does. It converts the soul. Anybody in here can change your behavior. You can change your behavior and act like a little Christian. You can. And then go live any way you want when you go outside the doors, you're right? But, but a conversion, a, a real conversion, like he's talking about right here, reaches down beneath this brain matter, beneath our conscience, beneath our thinking, and reaches the soul, the inner man. Now when God does something, he does it good, doesn't he? That's why he said the law of God is perfect, converting the soul. The reason this morning that I'm looking at people who love Jesus Christ, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, raise your hand. That's unanimous, folks. The reason is not because of you. It's because your soul, your inner man, has been converted, reverted back to following our Creator. That's marvelous, isn't it? And that is the work. It is the God of heaven that does that work. It is. Notice the next part. The testimony. It's a kind of a, testimony is kind of a, if I give a testimony of what God has done for me, it's a verbal expression of how God has dealt with me. He said, and so it's, again, it's the word of God. So he says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. When you recognize what God's done for you, that you didn't do it for yourself, you're no longer simple. Now, you know what simple-minded is, right? Somebody who's simple-minded, I mean, they just, they think on the lowest level of things, right? But I tell you what, somebody who has come under the understanding that, that God did this to me and for me, you may not have much earthly education. You may have eighth grade education. You may not, you may be a PhD. It doesn't matter. Whatever situation you're in, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're educated or not very educated or no educated, you're wisest, wiser than most people. 
because you recognize he's your Savior. You recognize that God's real and that he's rescued me. I want you to know just a PhD doesn't impress me. But somebody who knows God like that, I have so much respect for them. It doesn't make any difference what kind of education they have. I have a tremendous amount of respect for them. Don't you? The statutes. See, the statutes of the Lord. Another word for the word of God. All right. Now, there might be statutes on the books of San Antonio law that might not be right. Could be. Probably are. But his statutes, his law, his word is right. If you want to know what's right about something, whether this is the right thing to do or this is the right place to go, whether this is the right attitude that I should have, then we need to go to the statutes. If we wanted to know whether we can put a, uh, a sign right on the corner of the triangle out here, we go back to the statute, and I already know this, because we've already dealt with it. We have to go to the city statutes and look at them and see what it says that triangle's all about. Now, I know it's not platted. And some of you old timers know that that triangle out there is not platted. So it would be a no, right? But you have to go to the statutes to see. If you want to know what's right, I mean, I'll counsel with you. Pastors ought to be willing to counsel when necessary. But I'm going to warn you. We don't have, as pastors, some kind of uh, uh, mysterious, secret power within ourselves. Pastors don't have that. But what they do have is the Word of God. Now, I had somebody come to me counseling one time, and and. They wanted me to counsel them about something they were doing. And they were sitting at the table with me. And I said, well, let's read from the word of God. He said, I thought you'd just tell me what you thought. And I said, I said, what I think don't amount to a hill of beans. But what God thinks is. Let me read it to you. I didn't say this because I didn't think about it then. But I'm saying it now. Let me read it to you from the statutes of what you ought to do about this. Do you get it? And notice what it says about it. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. When you read it from God's word and you're shown the right way, you shouldn't go like this. Now everybody watch, it going on video. Man, I wish that hadn't been in the Bible. No, we should rejoice that we have an answer. That God gave us the right answer, right? And I tell you, I'm so thankful. And, and I have so much more time to read and study nowadays than I have in the past. But I tell you, I'm made to rejoice from God's word when I find out something I hadn't known before or it was already in the Bible and it had been there. I read it dozens of times through cover to cover. But I see it and I never saw it before. You say, how is that possible, preacher? Well, I tell you what to do. You read it about ten times and then come back and ask me that question. Because next time you read it, you'll see something you didn't see before. And the next time you read it, you'll see something you didn't see before. And guess what it makes your heart do? Rejoice! Because God gave you an inexhaustible source of his word that's so tremendously beneficial. i got to hurry. Quick. Rejoicing the heart. 
the commandment of the Lord. That's another word for the word of God. It's pure. I like, I like that. That means it's untainted. Let me tell you, God has promised to preserve. Thou will preserve them from this generation forever, David says. The word of God has been preserved for his generation and forever. So we have the word of God that's been preserved for us. That's a miracle in itself, isn't it? The commandment of the Lord is pure. You don't have to look and say, look at it. now you look in there and it looks to me like this has a contradiction in it. Well, let me just warn you. If you're reading in the Bible and you think something's a contradiction, the contradiction is not the Bible. The contradiction is you and your understanding of the Bible. It's knit together perfectly. It's pure word. David says, as, a, as gold tried in a furnace seven times, the word of God is so pure. And so the problem is with us because we're weak and we're finite and we're sinners and we're imperfect. And so we might not totally understand it, but there's an answer for whatever the difficulty you're running into is you just have to find the answer. Keep reading. Amen. Enlightening. Enlightening. You know, the, uh, we, we've been through the age of enlightenment, remember? The age of in, all the paintings and all the literature and coming out of the dark ages and into the age of enlightenment. And some of it was real enlightening and some of it was not too enlightening. But God's people who know him and know his word have been an enlightened people. Far above skills in painting, far above literary enlightenment, because knowing his word makes us far more enlightened than the world is. Notice how he refers to the word of God in the next verse. The fear. Now listen. The fear, he refers to the word of God as the fear. Now, it's to be respected. One definition of fear is respect, respected. But another one is, another definition of fear is fear. So when you have words like this in God's word in Galatians, where Paul says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That strikes fear in my heart. Because I know that what I do, whatever I sow in my works, my words, my actions, I'm going to reap what I sow. It's like a man goes into the cornfield or in the field and he sows corn. He ain't going to get okra. That's the quickest thing I could think of. Okra. He's going to get corn. It's my field. I'm sowing it. And I put corn, then I'm going to receive corn. That's what he's saying. So we need to sow to the spirit. Live spiritual. Live close to God. Do good. Be kind. Be merciful. And guess what? You'll reap kindness and mercy. And goodness, if you sow that, it just means be good. But if you don't, you need to fear. 
Now you start thinking back in retro. If you're running the tape recorder back, start thinking about some of the things that you've done, done maybe in the past, and you start thinking about, well, that was a bad thing I did. Probably, if you keep thinking, you can think about, well, I paid for that one because I reaped what I sowed. You understand? So we need to be cognizant of the idea that the Word of God is to be feared. It is to be respected, but it is to be feared. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's not dirty. It's not tainted. It's clean, enduring forever. Not like that, don't you? You know, the Word of God as we in its present form as we have it right now is going to endure as long as this world stands. He'll have, his, he'll have his word to his people as long as the world stands. He will. But then when we get to heaven, guess what? We get the real word. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then a couple of verses later, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know who John's talking about? Christ. And he spent the whole entirety of the gospel of John proving that this man, the word of God, Jesus, is God. So guess what? When we'll no longer need the pages of this book, we have the real thing. In heaven, it goes on forever. The judgments of the Lord, that is what God has decided, his law. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Now you might read in the Bible expressions like Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. You might say, that's not fair. Hold the phone. Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel chapter 4, he works his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? His judgment is right. Now, you may not understand it. That's a given. You might not understand it, but I want you to understand his judgments as recorded in his word and his judgments regarding you are right and righteous all together. That means every single one of them. Isn't that glorious to know? And sometimes God allows things in our lives. You know, he allowed Satan to touch the body of Job. He did. He allowed it. What did it ultimately do? Give glory to God. Him, Joseph was, was allowed, Joseph was, you know, the uh, brother of some rascals. And God allowed those rascals to afflict their brother, throw him into a pit, sell him to the Midianites, end up in the darkness of Egypt. He did that. He allowed that. His judgment was to allow Joseph to be taken prisoner in Egypt. When his brothers figured out that that was, when they went down for grain, y'all know the whole story, but when they went down for grain, they found out when, when Joseph revealed himself to him, and they recognized it was Joseph, they were terrified. Because you know what they thought? Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's what they thought. Guess what? Joseph said to him, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. His judgments are right all together. Excuse me. He says, uh, 
the, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Now, I'll read this and close. Talking about the law, more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now, I tell you what, <clears throat> when the Spirit of God's with you and you're blessed of God, to read the Word of God and reap its benefit and nothing sweeter on earth. Nothing better than that. That's the truth. Because it's God's word given to a undeserving people because he loved us and he wants you to be blessed in this life. To be blessed and to give glory to him. May God bless you. Would you pray with me? We love you, dear Lord. We thank you for your mercy and for your kindness. Truly, Lord, you're worthy of our worship this morning and all the days of our life. Truly, Lord, you've done so much for us. And we're so thankful from our hearts for all you've done and for the sweet privilege that we have of gathering together and worshiping thee, the true and the living God, we're so thankful. We do thank you for the church. Thank you for the blessing of leaving the affairs of this life behind and assembling like this to give you glory and to give you honor. We pray, Lord, this morning that this service has been honoring to you and that your people's hearts have been made to rejoice. And we pray, Father, that you give us the grace to live by your word and the precepts and the statutes and the law of God that they'll really mean something to us and that our Bibles won't, won't gain dust on the coffee table, but our Bibles, Lord, will be used and be worn out in service to thee. That's our prayer. And we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we depart this place. We, have, we depart trusting that you'll be with us and that you'll bless us to come back together in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we have a number? Sing a song. A closing song. At least a couple of verses of a song. Maggie, what you got? 43, number 43, as we close the service. Everybody stand.